It's a kind of a neat piece of physics. It ends up with a truly enormously ridiculously big number, um, but mainly I want to talk about it because it gives me an excuse to show you this. So this is a composite of an optical picture, so the kind of the grey bits of stars, and a radio picture. So the pinky stuff is what you see if you had radio eyes, and the grey stuff is what you see with normal optical eyes. And as you say, there is this kind of tight jet of material coming out, and you can see, so this is a whole galaxy, a large galaxy in the middle. And you can see the radio emission is way, way bigger than even the whole extent of the galaxy. It's enormous scale that's going on here. In fact, you can trace back, because you can see these little lines where it's coming from, it actually originates clearly near the middle of the galaxy. And as we know, strange things lurk at the centre of galaxies, and therefore it's probably, even though it's on an enormous scale, it's probably somehow intimately tied to what's going on right in the middle of the galaxy. This must be a very different galaxy to live in, that with something this dynamics coming out of the centre. Like if something like that was coming out the centre of our galaxy, that feels like it would be a game changer. That's an interesting question. I'm not sure it would, unless you happen to be you know, unlucky and getting right in the way of where these jets are headed, because it's so tightly collimated, actually it doesn't have much impact on most of what's going on in the galaxy. It really is only if you're unlucky enough to get in the way. But one, one interesting question, and the thing that we're going to be able to answer with this synchrotron minimum energy stuff is, how important is it in the sense that is this just kind of big and showy, or is there actually a, you know, a lot of energy associated with it, a lot of energetic processes, and is it really kind of something we have to worry about in terms of how it interacts with the galaxy, the effect it might have on the galaxy? We have to talk about where this, or this emission comes from, what causes it, and then that will allow us to then unpack the, how much energy there is packed away in these radio jets and hence whether it's actually an important structure or just something that looks pretty. So the process that emits these radio waves is a process called synchrotron emission, which is where you have a magnetic field and a bunch of charged particles. And when you've got a magnetic field and a bunch of charged particles, the charged particles interact with the magnetic field, they sort of spiral around it. And because they're now not travelling in a straight line anymore, that means they're being accelerated. And whenever you take a charged particle and accelerate it, it emits radiation. And in this particular case, it's the, the energies of the particles are such that it'll emit that radiation in the radio part of the spectrum. So the physical process that's leading to this emission is just basically you've got the magnetic fields associated somehow with these structures and charged particles and the combination of the two, the charged particles travelling around, orbiting around the magnetic field lines, then produce this synchrotron emission. In this particular case, what's the source of our magnetic field and what's the source of our charged particles? So almost certainly both you can trace back again just following the line back to the middle. It's something to do with what's going on in the middle here. And whatever it is, is tangling up magnetic field lines which will create stronger and stronger magnetic fields, but also producing these particles which then get accelerated out along the jets. And the synchrotron just means the reason, the, the, so there's another kind of, of radio emission you get from electrons travelling in magnetic fields called cyclotron. The difference between synchrotron and cyclotron is it's called synchrotron when the electrons are travelling at relativistic speeds. So we know these electrons are being shot along at incredibly high speeds and producing these radio emission because of that. Initially you were saying charged particles, now you're saying electrons. They are electrons, I mean they have to be protons as well because you can't have, you have to have a kind of a fair a charge balance in this process. So there are protons being shot along as well, but the electrons are the one that give their presence away by producing the, the strong uh, radio waves that we see. Fundamentally we don't know why you see this phenomenon in some galaxies and in other galaxies. You tend to see these kind of big radio jets where there's a big elliptical galaxy for example, but not all large elliptical galaxies produce these radio jets. So there's something that makes some galaxies produce them and others not, or that maybe all galaxies do it, but they just switch on and switch off and we catch some in the act, but not others. So there's obviously a very strong magnetic field far away from this galaxy. Actually, it turns out it's not strong at all. It's actually a very weak magnetic field, but it's very, very large. That's the thing. There's a lot of magnetic field there, but actually the, the field strength at any given place is actually quite small. So it turns out when you calculate it, it's, a, it's actually a very tiny magnetic field creating a magnetic field at all around a galaxy like that? So the whole of space is permeated with magnetic fields. There's a kind of primordial magnetic field out there in space. And presumably what's happening here is that some process is sort of concentrating that magnetic field, so making it stronger. So it's still very weak, but actually you know, stronger than it used to be. Some, again, something to do with the black hole in the middle, pulling material in and strength, pulling the magnetic field lines in and creating a stronger magnetic field. So now we have to get to the, the, the crux of the matter is, does it matter, right? Is it just all for show or is there actually much energy associated with this and so we actually have to worry about it on an astrophysical scale. And this takes us back to the 1950s when this was first figured out by a guy called Jeffrey Burbage who came up with a very elegant way of showing quite how much energy there has to be associated with these jets. We know there are relativistic particles in these jets and there's clearly there's energy associated with those relativistic particles because there's kind of the kinetic energy of the particles themselves. 
And we sort of have some handle on how much energy that actually is because we can see how much radio emission there is. And obviously the more rapidly moving particles there are, the more radio emission we'll see. So the maths go something like, Ugh. luminosity you see is proportional to the energy stored in the electrons times the magnetic field strength to the three halves power, it turns out. This is just basically saying that the way that the, 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 you get stronger luminosity coming out if either there's more high energy particles or if there's more magnetic field. So we could rearrange this because we can measure the luminosity and the thing we want to know is how, how much energy is there stored in there. We could rearrange this to say that the energy we store is proportional to that luminosity that is over B to the three halves power. That means that we measure the luminosity and so and we want to know what this energy stored in the uh, the, the electrons is, but unfortunately we don't know what the magnetic field is. We can guess, but we don't actually know what it is, but we can say, okay, so we don't actually know what it is, but we could plot how much energy there is stored if we just allow that magnetic field to change. Okay, and so as this magnetic field goes up, the energy stored goes down, because that's in the denominator, so it's going to do something like that. And we know we're somewhere along that curve. We don't know what the magnetic field is, but we know, you know, if the magnetic field were this value, then that would be what the energy was stored. But it turns out that's not the only source of energy in these jets, because there's also energy stored in the magnetic fields themselves. If you've ever taken two magnets and tried to push their poles together, you know that they push each other apart. And actually, when you push them together, you've stored some energy. So the stronger you make a magnetic field, the more energy there is actually stored in the magnetic field itself. So it's a second term we need to worry about, energy stored in the magnetic field. And it turns out that that's proportional to the magnetic field squared. Right. As you crank up the magnetic field, there's more and more energy stored in the magnetic field. Similarly, as you push two magnets closer and closer together, there's more and more energy stored because you've got a stronger and stronger magnetic field. So if we were to plot this contribution, that one goes the other way, right? That actually, as, as B increases, the, magnetic, the energy stored in the magnetic field goes up. So it's going to do something like that. And of course, the total energy is just the sum of these two terms. It's the sum of the energy stored in the electrons, the relativistic particles, which goes down with the magnetic field, and the energy stored in the magnetic field itself, which goes up with the magnetic field. And the total energy is just the sum of the two, which is going to do something like that when we add the two together. So again, we still don't know what the answer is, because actually we don't know what the magnetic field is still, and we just know that tells us that the total energy lies somewhere along that line. But we have a minimum. We have a minimum, indeed. So we know that the, the energy has to be stored, that is stored in there has to be at least that much. We know that there's some minimum energy stored. When you go through the calculations, which is what Burbage first did in the 1950s, it turns out that amount of energy is a ridiculously huge amount of energy. I mean, this is a galaxy. I'm not, everything's huge when you deal with galaxies. Okay, this, even by galaxy standards, this is huge. So the, the amount of energy you typically get for a galaxy like this, system like this, it works out that the energy stored in these radio jets, at the minimum energy, remember it could always be more than that, is about 10 to the 52 joules. That's one with 52 zeros after it joules. And again, you're right, every number's big in astronomy, so let's put that in a little bit of perspective. The sun gives out quite a lot of energy. And one of the things that people think about in terms of very advanced civilizations is this idea of these things called Dyson spheres, right? You could actually take all the energy of the sun and use it, bend it to your will, do what you want with it. So if we were to build a Dyson sphere around the sun, and in fact, if we were to build a Dyson sphere around every star in the Milky Way, then if we wanted to get that much energy, the amount of energy stored in these radio lobes, we'd have to take all the energy from all the stars in the Milky Way for hundreds of millions of years. And that really is a ludicrously large amount of energy. And it tells you immediately that actually this is a very energetic process that's going on in these jets. We're always told energy can't be created or destroyed. Yes. Like, like this energy that's living in these lobes, which is blowing our minds, yep. didn't just like come from nowhere. Nope. It started somewhere else. Where did it come from? Where? So, and there's the, well, there's the clue, right? That you can see where the jets come from. They come from right in the middle of the galaxy. And we know at the center of every galaxy, there's a supermassive black hole. And we know that one of the most efficient ways there is of liberating energy is to drop things into a black hole. You basically remember that if you've got some mass M, the total amount of, of energy associated with it is via Einstein's famous equation, mc squared. And it turns out you actually, if you drop something of mass m into a black hole, you liberate some large fraction of mc squared in the process. So it's an immensely efficient way of liberating energy. And if you were to power these radio lobes by dropping matter into the black hole in the middle, it works out you'd have to drop about 100,000 times the mass of the sun into that black hole. Which is, sounds like a big number, but actually the black hole's probably um, several hundred million solar masses in size. So actually it's a small fraction of the total mass of that black hole. 
but by feeding the black hole in the middle, you can generate these huge amounts of energy you need to create these radio lobes. If you'd like to see even more about synchrotron radiation, in particular how it's used by scientists here on Earth, well, I've made a lot of videos about that. You can check them out, I'll put links on the screen and in the video description. And if just huge objects in space like this galaxy fascinate you, you really need to be checking out Deep Sky Videos, which is our dedicated astronomy channel, and each video is about a different galaxy or cluster of stars telling you amazing things about them. It's really worth checking out. Again, links on the screen and in the description. Also a reminder you can support 60 Symbols on Patreon like these people here. And as always, thank you for watching.